So as I ask different people to teach different sessions, normally people are like, ah, let me pray about it. <laughs> but this is one of those times where I ask people and every single person was, yes, I would love to. And I think part of it is because it's a niche, right? It's that one area, that one topic that you've experienced or you're passionate about. And so I have the pleasure of talking about discipleship this morning. And I thought it might be helpful to just share my testimony first regarding discipleship. I got saved when I was around 12 years old. And within a week, maybe two, of making a profession of faith, I went to um, an older, wiser woman in my church, and I asked her to disciple me. And I was 12, and she was 24. <laughs> right? So, but to me, she was older and wiser. And I'll tell you, her name was Elisa, because she'll probably come up throughout this morning in different examples. Um, and she said yes, and then she handed me a contract. And this contract said things like, if you cancel twice in more than a period of time, we're done. If you show up without your work done twice in a period of time, we're done. And it also included things like, speaking of herself, I am going to give you the word. I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to speak truth into your life. And if that's not something you want, then we probably shouldn't do this. And at that time, it was a large church, just to give you some context, about a thousand people. And she was um, highly in demand to be a discipler. It was a very disciple-oriented church. And so she gave me this contract, and honestly, it made me excited because it told me that she was going to push me, and she had high expectations for me, and we weren't messing around. And so our discipleship lasted from age 12 to about age 21, once a week. And it looked like a lot of different things throughout that period of time. There were some things that we did sometimes, and there were some things that we did every single time we met. So the sometimes were, we might sometimes go through a book of the Bible together. We went through Isaiah and Titus, and we would just do chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph. Sometimes she provided a topical study on something relevant. Maybe it was something she was studying, and it was something that really struck home, and so she decided to share it with me. Um, other times it was things that was relevant to my life. So one week we might look at every verse that contained the word gossip or thankfulness or faithfulness, things like that. We would do topical studies. Other times we would do a service project together. We would visit nursing homes. Um, there was one year that she and I adopted a family for Angel Tree ourselves and we went and bought the presents, we wrapped them together, and we went and delivered them together to that family. Other things that we did is she just simply invited me into her home. I would go over for the whole day and watch her make peanut butter and jelly for her kids, and we would walk down to the park, we would hang out. It just kind of depended upon the season and what the need was in my life is what it looked like. But I would say that no matter what we did, there was always, what are you reading, what are you studying, what are you learning, how are you growing, and how are you struggling, and how can I pray for you? I mean, even if I was just hanging out at her house, her kids went down for a nap, and that's how the conversation turned, to those biblical things of the word and growth and sanctification. The other thing that we always did every single time, no matter the circumstance, is pray together. Um, and she modeled that for me. And... The last thing that we did, pretty much every single time we got together, is we worked on scripture memory. It was one of those assignments that you needed to do and come up and, and show up with it done. She was with me for many, many years, every week. And I look back and I think about that and I think, what does a 24-year-old have in common with a 12-year-old? Not a whole lot. I'm sure I wasn't interesting. I'm sure I wasn't like a conversational prowess with her or anything like that. I'm sure I was obnoxious and young. I mean, I was a child. I was a new believer in the faith. But she overlooked a multitude, I'm certain, of character flaws to simply spend time and invest in me. And 
I would say it was transformative. I would say 90% of my Bible knowledge now comes from her. I mean, it got to the point where we had 100, 150 verses memorized, and we had to set aside two, three-hour sessions to review them and quiz each other. The other beautiful thing about it is she never asked me to do anything that she wasn't doing alongside of me. So if I was memorizing a verse or doing a text study, she was doing it alongside of me. Um, And so I feel like that made it meaningful, and it really laid a biblical foundation. I still talk to her once a week on the phone. We're on other sides of the country, but she is still my discipler. Isn't that funny? She is still that person that if I had a question or if I had a concern or if I were going through a crisis, she would be the one I contact. This is an unusual, wonderful blessing in my life. A lot of discipleship doesn't look like that. My dad also discipled me, and I'll share a little bit more about that later. It was much more informal, but so discipleship can look like a lot of things, and we'll see that as we go. But I wanted to share with you that, because that's the story of my life, of why I'm doing this. Because that's what I have, that's what I have experienced. And man, wouldn't it be amazing if all the women of Cornerstone, if all the believers in Billings had somebody to walk with like that? to walk alongside of you, or if you were able to come alongside of someone else. So that's really what we're looking at today. My goal, because there's so much about discipleship, I had a hard time wading through all the materials and deciding, what do you say? What do you leave out? Because you can't possibly drink from a fire hose. I can't back up the dump truck and just say, here you go. So my goal for today is that we would leave with a biblical foundation for discipleship. Looking at why should we disciple, what should it look like, more or less, scripturally, biblically. And then, Lord willing, if we have time at the end, I'd like to um, address, you can interrupt with questions anytime, but I want to address questions specifically at the end, and then also look at the very practical. So here's how Jesus did it, now what? What does it look like? For us. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. So you have two packets for today. You have a fat, I call it the fat packet and the skinny packet. (laughs) The fat packet is resources. We may or may not get to that this morning, but I wanted to put it into your hands to take with you for later in case we don't have time. And it's just very, very practical materials you could use in discipleship. Um, or also just basic guidelines as a discipler, and you could always keep those in mind as a disciplee. The other packet, the skinny packet, is what we're going to walk through together this morning. So you're going to need the skinny packet and something to write with. All right, so to start this morning, on the top of your first page, all I want you to do is jot down three to five words that come to your mind when you hear the word discipleship. There's no right or wrong. Any... Three to five words. All right, let's just hear some. Just throw some out there. What are some words that come to your mind when you hear the word discipleship? Accountability. Okay, accountability. Change. Teaching. Sanctification. Sanctification. Time. Time. Mm -hmm. That's a great one, actually. Commitment. Commitment. Good. Student. Student. Mm -hmm. Desire. Desire. Life on life. Life on life, good. Action. Action. Guide. Guide. Love. Love, good. I'm going to be repeating everything you say this morning for the sake of the recording, just so you know. (laughs) You're not like, (laughs) Um, and for the people that might not have heard it. So those were great. Some ones that stood out to me from what you threw out there was time, commitment, accountability, There wasn't any of them that wasn't applicable, though, was there? Um, So I think before we get too far, we really need to define what discipleship is. I think discipleship is fairly familiar to us in terms of the Bible, because we see Christ with his disciples, and we see what he did, and so we're all fairly familiar with the New Testament and the Gospels. So anyone who follows and spreads the teaching of another is a disciple. So there were even disciples of like Greek philosophers, right? Where they would 
learn what somebody's philosophy was, and then they would spread it on to someone else. And so we see Christ's disciples coming alongside of him, learning from him, and then spreading it to someone else. I think a lot of times when I think of disciple, I think of student, I think of pupil. Does anybody else think that? I think that the, the one shortcoming is that you can be a pupil and take everything in and then just keep it, right? Whereas with th- discipleship, the difference is you receive in order to give to someone else. I mean, that's really the aim. In scripture, the word disciple is used in two different ways. Um, The first one is for conversion. And so we see in Acts 14, it says, When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium. So they didn't bring those disciples back with them and train them. They didn't stay there and train them. They simply made converts, which they called disciples, and then they left. So in scripture, when we're studying, that's one way that we see it. So discipleship is evangelism. And we don't tend to think of it that way. But that is a form of discipleship in the Bible. The other that we see is for growth. And this is more of what I think of discipleship. It's that process of you get saved, you get baptized, and more or less, then you're trained. You spend your life pursuing God's word, sanctification, and you have people coming alongside of you to help you do that. And that's really, to me, from spiritual birth to physical death process. Because there'll be stages in there where you're being taught and you're being trained, and there'll be stages in there where you're the one training and departing information to someone else. And we really see this in the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And so it's that end process of really teaching to observe that we see. Um, The one thing I want to point out here before we go too much farther, just in case there might be some misconception, is there is great division in the church about what is a Christian and what is a disciple. Because there are some who hold to the thought that there are Christians and then there are disciples. And a Christian is a convert who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and that is that. And then there is the more committed or um, enthusiastic, maybe, I don't know, I don't want to say a fanatic, but there are some who believe that you can be a Christian and not be a disciple. Have you heard this? Um, But that is not really what scripture holds at all. If you're a Christian, you're called to be a disciple. You can't separate those two. Um, This reference here, Acts 26, just the tail end of the verse says, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So it wasn't that Christians were called disciples. It was the disciples were called Christians. And they're used synonymously. Um, And so there's this notion where you can become a Christian, but you don't need to grow at all in your faith. And we just don't see that picture in Scripture. There's a call to come and to grow and be in Christ as a new creation. I want you to think for a minute, and you can even jot a couple reasons down if you want, about what it keeps you, and this this question doesn't come with any criticism or judgment whatsoever, what keeps women from discipling someone else? Or what keeps women from asking to be discipled? Because I would say... Thinking about Cornerstone, that discipleship happens in little pockets with a couple individuals here and there, but I wouldn't say that it's like a culture, a normal culture of our church yet. Mm -hmm. We're working on it, right? Um, But I want us to think for a couple of minutes about why this isn't happening. So I'm going to give you a minute or two, jot something down if you want, and then we'll share a couple of reasons. What do you think? Why doesn't discipleship happen today? Time. Okay. Lack of time. A lot of us work. Feel inadequate. 
good. A feeling of inadequacy. <clears throat> Especially to disciple someone else. Fear and pride. Okay. Like, they kind of go together. Yeah. Like, afraid to ask somebody. Uh huh. Comes as a result of my own pride to. Sure. Mm-hmm. It could be a fear of rejection, a fear of a no, a fear of inconveniencing someone else, asking too much. Or just changes of life. You know, over the last year and a half, I got married and had a baby. Yeah. Like, it's hard to get back into what I used to do. Like, sure. What I'm supposed to do now. Yeah. So it's like a different. Right. And figuring out now, like, where is it going to fit? What's it going to look like? How's it going to happen? With whom? Where? How? All of that. Good. There's a couple of other cultural things that I've thought about as well. Um, And one is that as a Western society, for the most part, this is my experience, maybe it's not yours, I find that we live pretty isolated lives. Um, When we look back to the time of Scripture, you had multi-generations living together. That's not the case. I don't even live in the same state as my parents and grandparents. Um, But even if you do live in the same state, you're not in the same home. I think of my own neighborhood where everyone keeps to themselves. I don't run to my neighbor's house to talk or to share like, ah, Sean was doing this. What should I, you know, we just don't have those types of conversations in our in our everyday um, settings. And so with that isolation of our culture, I think it makes discipleship harder. And I think it also goes against the norm of what our relationships are like. Um, I think also that as a church and as a larger culture, we keep generations split up. Don't you have your seniors group and your college group and then your... And so there's not a lot of intergenerational ministry going on of being together. Um, And I think I'm really thankful for growth groups at Cornerstone just because they are so mixed up and there's an opportunity to get to know all sorts of different people of all sorts of different ages and stages of life that we can learn from one another. Um, I think that part of our culture, too, leads to, I, I want to say this kindly, but it leads to a disrespect between generations. Why would I ask you when I can Google and get a thousand experts? You know? Um, and so... Because of that, in an age of technology, and we don't get a lot of time together, it just doesn't make discipleship natural or fluid in our interactions. And the last thing that came to mind is, the reality is, is I don't think that really we like unsolicited advice very much these days. If we want advice, we usually go seek it out on the internet, don't you? If you want to know, like, this is what's going on with my child, here's the symptoms, would you pick up a phone or would you, well, you probably would pick up your phone, but just to Google, not to make a call, right? Um, and so we've been, we've been talking on Tuesday nights going through Titus 2 with the ladies, and discipleship is a lot in there. And the biggest reason I have been hearing from our group on both sides of why discipleship doesn't happen is that fear, Afraid to offer discipleship to someone else because it seems presumptuous and arrogant, and I'm conveying to you that you have a need and I can meet it. Um, also, a fear of feeling inadequate, too, like you said, of maybe you've never been discipled before yourself. And so, then how do you go about this with somebody else? But then also a fear of asking um, because who do you ask? And What if they say no, and what if I'm inconveniencing them, and all sorts of things. And so there's a lot in us personally and culturally that keeps us from discipling. So I want us to look at why we should. There's a couple of reasons that we're going to focus on in terms of why we should, and it's the command and the need. And so for the command, I would love it if a couple of you would be willing to look up some scriptures. Would somebody look up Matthew 28, 19, and 20 for me? Who would do that? Thank you, Sally. Who would do Titus 2, 3 to 5? Thank you, Alicia. And 2 Timothy 2, 2? Great. Thank you, Betsy. All right, so I'll give you just a minute to get there, and then we'll look at what God's word has to say. All right, Matthew 28. This is super familiar. I should make somebody quote it, actually. (laughs) All right, go ahead, Sally. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Good. So we see in that text, it's an imperative. There's a fancy word, right, for a command. It's commanded. We have there the main verb, go, and then some sub-commands with it. Go, make disciples, that's command number one after go, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. And the interesting thing to keep in mind with this particular text is that these were Christ's parting words, right? That's why we call it the Great Commission. And so with these being his parting words, they feel weightier to me. Do they feel weightier to you? Knowing, thinking through, these are my last moments with my disciples here on this earth. I am leaving. What's the one thing I want to leave them with? And this is what he says. Go and make, and make disciples, teaching them to obey. Okay? That is so clear cut. I don't think there's even anything for us to divide over in that text, even if we wanted to. How about Titus 2, 3 to 5? Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Good. So this is the text that we've been studying on Tuesday nights for close to a month. I think we have one more week left. We'll see if we can finish it. Um, and really, the, the emphasis there in verse 3, you have a standard of living for the older women. And the reason at the end of verse 3, so that they can teach what is good. And so there was this relationship of passing on that was expected. First a modeling and then a sharing that with the younger generation in Christ. Okay, um, In Titus 2. And 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Good. So in that particular text, you have the Apostle Paul, and he has a young pastor, Timothy, who's trying to shepherd a church, perhaps for the first time. And Paul is asking him to pass on. So you've received this from me, Timothy. Now you need to share it with faithful men. Okay? Um, and we're going to talk about that idea of faithful men as we go on. Of Who do you disciple? But it was a command there again in all three of these to disciple. We know that it's commanded, but there's also a real need for discipleship. I see the real need because all of you are here, mm-hmm. right? Um, a need to be discipled and to disciple. And there's really three reasons I want us to focus on. First, spiritual children need to be fed. Okay? Um, And there we have 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, Brothers, I couldn't address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food, for you weren't ready for it. And even now, you're not yet ready. And the very similar and probably well-known 1 Peter 2.2 2, of newborn infants longing for the pure spiritual milk of the word. And I think back to my time with Elisa and how we started early on. And she really spoon fed me in a lot of ways scripture. When we first started, she, would, um, she taught me how to study the word. She taught me how to be in the word. She modeled for me how to pray. And then eventually she asked me to pray. Um, and the other thing she did, which I didn't know until years and years later, <laughs> was she called my parents. And she asked them what they saw in my character. What was, of course, they had nothing to say. <laughs> no, they had a lot to say, actually. Um, what they saw in me that needed refining. Where was I prone to sin? Um, things of like that. And... I didn't know it because she didn't take it and, like, provide a lesson, like, on respecting your parents. You know, she didn't do that. Um, But I do think that she shaped 
scripture to meet my need and to feed. And it goes to that next one about needing to be protected. I think she took that information and she fell on her face before the Lord on my behalf. And so even when I didn't know it, she was praying for me. She was praying for my character. She was praying for my sanctification in areas of my life that she wasn't even all the time addressing me, addressing me directly about it, but she was always talking to the Lord about it. And I really feel like she protected me in a lot of ways just by being a prayer warrior for me when I didn't know it. Um, in 1 Peter 5, 8, I include that just because I... We do have an adversary, right? Sometimes we're afraid to admit we have an adversary or we don't think about it or I don't know, but we do have an adversary. And so a young believer who is not strongly equipped in studying the word or when facing struggle, going and addressing that in scripture or not strong in prayer, imagine somebody else doing that on their behalf for a time and being trained up in that way. And in 1 Corinthians 4, this is Paul just talking to the Corinthians, and he calls himself their father um, through the gospel. And I like that just because I don't think we should like go around to each other and be like, I'm your mother <laughs> through the gospel. But it's that he was taking on himself a responsibility in that role. Um, think about you with children. You provide for them. You watch over them. You take responsibility for them. When you see possibility of, of harm, of any facet, you don't sit idly by, but you take action. And that's what a young believer needs, is somebody to be willing to stand in the gap and be willing to protect them in ways that they perhaps can't yet protect themselves. And beyond feeding from that first point, they're also, they need to be taught, okay? And this is more of that, instead of the basics, real training along the way. In Colossians 1, we see Paul say, we proclaim him warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. And so it's this process again. And I think we really see that needing to be taught again from Matthew 28 that we just read, right? We baptize them and then you teach them to obey all that I've commanded you in that same regard. Okay. So does anybody disagree with the fact that we need a disciple? Do we need to spend more time on that part? I was assuming that you were coming here and so therefore you would agree and so we could move on because otherwise why would you be here? <laughs> So, so let's talk about the how. I want to share with you, I don't have the, the jacket anymore. I've had this, man, forever. But this book is really old, 70s. Um, and it's called Jesus Christ Disciple Maker by Bill Hall. And this is probably, I don't, you never read one of those books that just is really impactful and life-changing? Um, this is probably in my top five. Um, it's just a fantastic book. And really what he does is he walks through Christ's life and how he discipled. And I like it because he does it chronologically. So you can see the stages of here's how Christ started with his disciples and kind of how he kind of changes what he does over time. And so some of what I'm going to share with you, I'm going to pull from here. Um, but I wanted to just commend that to you. I think with discipleship, and I've already heard from some of you that feeling of inadequacy. And so the very first thing when it comes to discipleship is preparing your own heart. And I don't mean like tidying up the outsides of your life, but instead really examining your own heart. And so number one on your outline is leading all of your areas of your life to Christ and seeking to grow. Psalm 139 at the end says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxious thoughts. None of you have those, right? Mm -hmm. And see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And so really just coming before the Lord in that type of way 
and just saying, Lord, I just want a clean house inside. Is there sin that I have just been comfortable with that I need to take care of before I would come alongside of someone else? And just asking the Lord, and I, isn't he always faithful to answer those types of prayers? I mean, I never go away from looking in the mirror <laughs> and not come up with some sort of issue that I need to work on. Um, secondly, inwardly, you need to be prepared to be an example. Is there unconfessed or hidden sin that would keep you from being an effective model? I want to emphasize unconfessed or hidden because we all have sin right we're all sinners we all struggle and chances are we probably all have our pet sins and by that I mean those sins that you tend to fall into maybe you tend to be a worrier maybe you tend to be a complainer I'm not talking about sin I'm talking about unconfessed I'm not willing to address this or hidden This is a secret part of my life that I'm keeping, and it's sinful, but I enjoy it, and so I'm not willing to look at it, repent of it, and let it go. Luke 6.40, um, Christ was talking there, and he said, A pupil is not above his teacher. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Isn't that a terrifying verse? (laughs) In context, he was talking about the blind leading the blind and how they're going to go over a cliff, right? But we can take that verse in the positive, too. Um, it's, it's kind of funny, but the example that's popping into my mind is that Elisa had a ring on her little finger. I was 12. I had to go buy a ring for my little finger, <laughs> you know? She, so there were things that we just emulate. You pick up from one another, and it might be intentional, Um, It might be unintentional, but who you spend time with, who is discipling you and training you, is eventually who you're going to look like, who you're going to talk like, who you're going to act like. And so it's really important in our lives to prepare our own hearts inwardly to say, Lord, is there any unconfessed sin that I need to bring to you? Next, inwardly, you need to prepare to sacrifice I heard at the very, very beginning somebody say time, right, is one thing that came to mind, and commitment. Um, You can't disciple well and be one foot in, one foot out. You need to be committed to this person, and if you're a disciplee, you need to be also committed. And so if you're not prepared or you're kind of like, oh, I'm not sure this is a really busy season of my life, or I just had a new baby, I'm not sure what this would look like or if it will fit in, maybe wait. Or maybe be prayerful on whether or not you should. Or if you're taking on somebody else, just do it with the knowledge that maybe your discipleship won't be a 10-year thing like mine was. I was like a special needs student. (laughs) Um, But you don't know, you know, but you need to be willing um, to come alongside. And lastly, you need to check your motive. It can't be about you or for you. It can't be because you like to be needed or because you're lonely um, or because you're arrogant. Um, There can be no self-centeredness behind this. It's you pouring into someone else for their benefit. And so you need to be ready with that. And lastly... You need to be willing to study, grow, and pursue Christ yourself. You will never take someone where you have not been. They will not surpass you. You cannot lead them through that minefield of life if you haven't navigated it first. And so there's never a place where you're done. I've met it. I'm good. And so now I can put it on cruise control. And so... Your discipleship relationship is only going to be as good as the time that you're spending in the Word, that you're spending in fellowship with God and pursuing Him. Because if He's not at the center of your life, personally, He's not, how is that going to work? And you're trying to point someone else to somebody else that you're not valuing right now. And so, a willingness to work in that. 
So that's preparing yourself inwardly. Did you all just complete that while I was talking? Done? Check. <laughs> Next is upward. We all rely upon Christ for all of this, right? We look to him for wisdom, power, and guidance. The reality is, is I've probably discipled, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so people, and I've been inadequate with every single one of them. Every single one of them. Just ask Suzanne. (laughs) There's never a time where I felt confident in what I was doing. But, you know, that pointed me straight back to Christ every single time. Because I didn't have the wisdom for this person. I didn't have all the answers for this person. But what I could do is point them to, to Jesus. And so as you prayerfully consider discipling somebody else, No, that's your only foundation. That's the only thing that you have to stand upon. After you've done those, then you can extend a hand for discipleship. You've examined your heart. You've examined your motive. um, You've examined and looked at your life for any hidden sin. And so now you're seeking Christ and you're ready to reach out to someone else and offer to come along side of them. So, how do we do it? The easiest thing is to look to Jesus. Isn't that always the best answer for everything? (laughs) Christ was the master discipler. And so, we need to follow his example. Um, And so, we're going to basically look through the basic who, what, when, where, why, how to answer this question. So, you tell me, just off the top of your head, who did Jesus disciple? Twelve. The twelve? Okay. Any other thoughts? He had other followers. He did. Beside the twelve people that just followed mm-hmm. and listened to his teaching. Yep. And he had the multitude. Um, we have, I'm just going to reference us back to what Paul said. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men. Okay? Um, and so we had the few. All right? So you had the masses. That's the many witnesses. What you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. Um, but he had the 12 that he focused on. And so that's, those were his faithful men. And then he focused even more intently on three of the 12. And spent even greater time with them. And you may have heard this acronym before. But when it comes to discipling or training someone else. You want to look for people who are faithful. Who are available. And who are teachable. And this text at the bottom comes from Mark chapter 1. It says, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee. Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed them. And so the one context that you don't get from reading this verse right here is that they had prior to this event come and just watched Jesus. So this wasn't some, I always thought this was a random stranger. Like, like somebody stops by your house house and says, hey, come and follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And you're like, leaving it all behind, right? Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. So there was this whole stage of Christ's ministry um, that Bill Hall in his book calls Come and See, where he encountered um, John the Baptist's disciples along the road. And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, come along and see. And then they meet a couple other people along the way, and he says, come along and see. And that's all it was, that initial call. There was no responsibility. There was no expectation. There was no demand. It was just come and witness, more or less, who I am. So this is a later event. They already came and saw, and now they're ready to follow. So we have them, at this point, certainly faithful. They dropped everything. Career, livelihood, All the ways they spent their days, the abandoned, family, home, all the comforts, 
and they followed. They weren't available, but they made themselves available here. Weren't they busy <laughs> when he came upon It's the middle of the work day. I think sometimes I think, eh, they were just fishermen. But that was the middle of their work day. And they made themselves available. And certainly we see them here as being teachable because they were wanting to follow, wanting to be with him, and wanting to grow. Okay, so what Jesus taught. I hesitated to put this in here because I feel like we could spend the next 365 days together in this room and just scratch the surface of what he taught. So let's just throw out some big ideas, big context of what were some of the things that Jesus taught his disciples. What do you think of? Yeah. If you see me, you see the Father. Okay. Seeking the Father, looking to him. Loving your enemies. Good. Loving your enemies. Serving one another. Serving. Yep. Trust. Good. Trusting. Trusting God. Whoever is the least is actually the greatest. Yeah. Humility. Least being the greatest. What else? Going the next, how do you say it? Extra mile. Extra mile. Mm hmm. Yeah. Going the extra mile. Understand the scriptures. Yeah. He taught them the word. He pointed them back to the Old Testament a lot. Let's hear two more. What else did he teach? Treasures in heaven and not on earth. Yep. Good. Just revealing who he truly is. Yep. He taught about himself and who he was. Good. So I'm not, I, did, I listed some. I didn't put them in any particular order. And I know that this is not even a drop in the bucket. But I wanted us to just hit some highlights. So one I already mentioned, serving others. We see that a lot in his ministry. But probably most poignantly when he was washing the feet of his disciples who most certainly didn't deserve it. So not just serving so that you would get something in return, but serving when you wouldn't get anything in return, and it's actually degrading. But you do it anyway, and you do it happily. Forsaking sin. Um, we see this throughout. His disciples got to witness his public teaching ministry. And so in Matthew 18, he was speaking to the masses, but his disciples were present. And he says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, etc. Um, he also teaches growth. And I put a text up there from Paul just because I love it. But it says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree to another. But for our purposes for Christ, probably a better text, but how do you put it up here, is the whole Sermon on the Mount. Because he says to them, you have heard, but now I say to you. So this is what you've known. This, is, this has been your standard of sanctification. And now I'm going to enlarge it. I expect growth, a standard of holiness. And so he pushed them through the Sermon on the Mount, um, as well as his other hearers. He also expected and taught obedience. He was fulfilling that great commission himself. In John 10, he uses the metaphor of being a shepherd. And a shepherd having sheep who follow, who listen, who obey. And so he um, taught them that. And then also to submit to God's will. In Matthew 26, isn't it great that he invited the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane with him? One of the most painful, horrific moments. Like, personally, I would want to go into my closet and do that by myself. <laughs> but he invited an audience to come alongside of him and to witness him struggle of, Lord, let this cup pass from me. And the Lord's answer, and they're repeated. And so they witnessed his anguish, his hurt, and also just that struggle and longing to submit to God's will. Um, he taught it and he modeled it. And then also that great one that we all love, which is being willing to suffer. Um, and he says that you will be hated by all because of my name. And he was talking directly to them. But it's the one who's endured to the end will be saved. And then just a couple of more. 
He taught them to love. They witnessed his interaction with the hated woman of Samaria, who was hated A, she was a woman, hated B, she was Samaritan, hated C, she was an adulteress. And she was the one that Christ said that he was the Messiah. He revealed that to her first. And so they witnessed his, his love for her and also his love in John 8 for the woman caught in adultery. Um, and then last, counting the cost. To me, this goes along with suffering a lot even. And that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The one thing that I really like about those things that Jesus taught is there wasn't anything about Calvinism or Arminianism or great doctrines of the faith like theology. But is there a place for that in discipleship? Yes, there absolutely is. But sometimes we feel inadequate because we forget that these things, they're not easy, but they are simple. Aren't they simple? To love, to obey, to serve, to be faithful. It doesn't have to be complicated. And you don't have to come with a doctorate um, of some sort or have a demon degree in order to do this. The only requirement for discipleship is that you're saved. If you're saved, you possess the gospel and you're ready to share it right? And as you grow, then you have some more to share. But it doesn't have to be the things that I think we think it needs to be. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be difficult. When did Jesus do this? All the time. Really, anytime, all the time, informally, informally. The thing that's really neat, the way Christ discipled, is he just said, come and see and come and follow. And so a large part of his ministry to the masses was simply done in the presence of the disciples. So when he was teaching, they heard it. When he was healing, they saw it. When the Pharisees were in his face, they witnessed how he was able to interact with them. Um, There wasn't any aspect of his ministry, for the most part, that they did not see. So, and that was almost like how Elisa did it with me. There were times that our discipleship was informal. I honestly remember watching her clip her children's toenails as I sat on the floor of her hallway. (laughs) That is true. (laughs) But I loved being there. I loved being with her. And, but there were other times where we both had our noses in the word and we were talking about the verbs and the words and what they meant and how, what does this have to do with me? And so there was that formal time as well. There were times where she would invite me as she was discipling someone else. And so I could just witness that. Um, or if she was talking with a group or if she was going to go on visitation to somebody who was sick in the hospital from church she would invite me along. So just as she was living her life and doing her normal ministry things, she just invited me. And so, but along the way, we always got back to what you were reading, how you were challenged, how you were struggling, how you were growing, every single time. And so it doesn't, I think there's something beautiful about informally witnessing somebody's life and walk with Christ. And you build relationship that way. And I think we saw Jesus doing that in the scripture with his men, too. Okay. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 1. I want us to just take a glimpse at Mark to answer this how. I was impressed in my study of really how much Christ accomplished with his disciples in this one chapter. Mark chapter 1 opens up more or less with John the Baptist. He's on the scene. He's preparing the way for Christ and his ministry. And he's that voice in the wilderness. So verses 1 through 8, we see John really making that proclamation of a coming Messiah. And then once we get to verses 9 through 13 we see that he um, is baptized in that scene, and it also does a really quick blurb of him being tempted in the wilderness of verse 13. 
So, in verse 14, we now see John. um, He's taken into custody, and Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. So we know from the chronology of all of the other gospels at this point that, that he did have disciples with him. Okay? So he's preaching. So, and his preaching is in verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And he's going along in verse 16, and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And this is part of the text that we just read. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed. So he has the invitation They've dropped everything, and they're with him. Verse 19, going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, poor guy, and they went along and followed him. In 21, it says they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. So there we see the disciples are with him. He takes them along with him into the synagogue. So they're all together and they're witnessing him teach. What a scene that must have been of him just waltzing into a synagogue on the Sabbath as a man of authority and teaching. And so they're witnessing that teaching ministry immediately off the bat. In 22, it says they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Then, 23, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. Well, well, well. (laughs) He cried out, what business do we have with each other? Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice. And I'll just stop there. So, Jesus is teaching. Then Jesus immediately starts a type of healing ministry and taking care of this man. And so, again, he, we don't see him instructing the disciples. They're not taking charge at this point. He is just having them in his life and modeling for them teaching and ministry. In verse 29... We see in that whole next section, I'll just paraphrase it. We see him healing Simon, Peter Simon's mom, who was sick with a fever. And he continues to heal throughout in verse 34 um, and 35, going throughout towns or the town and healing. 35, I do want to point out, it says, Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place. And was praying there. And Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said, everyone is looking for you. So there, he is modeling his own walk, his own need. He's modeling prayer for them. And so we see exactly how he was discipling all just in this first chapter, really. We see other times in other places that he takes them alongside for one-on-one instruction. Like when he would give the parables to the masses, and then we would get like 10 more verses of explanation for the disciples later. Things like that. Um, But it really, it wasn't complicated. It wasn't difficult. Um, But he more or less just invited them into his ministry and into his life and modeled for them and taught them along the way. And I just want to um, look together up here at John 17. So this is that end of time of Christ's ministry on earth. He's preparing himself for the crucifixion. He's praying on behalf of the disciples um, to the Lord. And I just want to highlight the, the red words. He says, now I'm coming to you that these things... I speak in the word, the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 
And as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them. And we see that in Matthew 28, into the world. For their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. And so we see, if we were to just pull out those words, he was discipling, he was pouring into them for their joy, to give them the word, to sanctify them, and then to send them out. Now what? You know the Bible says it, right? You know that it's commanded. You know that it's a need. We've gotten a glimpse of how Jesus said to do it. So, I would hope that you would be prayerful. Should you seek somebody to disciple you? Should you be willing to come along somebody else and disciple them? The answer to both of those is probably yes. You probably should be discipling and you probably should seek discipleship. Both, it just depends. Um, But also just having a willingness in your heart before the Lord and saying, Lord, is this something that you would have me do? And if so, would you make my heart willing to do it? Because this isn't in the comfort zone of a lot of people. Um, I would say, if you long to be discipled, watch the life of women in the church. Find somebody that you feel could be an example to you. With Elisa, nobody paired us up. I watched her life. I knew her. And so I asked her. She could have said no. People might say no. But I think it's perfectly acceptable to approach someone and say, I've just been really praying about discipleship, and I was wondering if you would be willing to pray about discipling me. That's it. And see what the Lord does. I've been a part of of churches and ministries where you kind of like, it's matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. That, where they like have a discipleship ministry where they pair people up. And um, that's tough because sometimes people don't jive in personalities um, and it's hard to know what the needs of, the real needs of what someone has and who could meet those needs. But I think I have found there's much more success Um, In my experience, that if you're willing to pray about it and take your time and ask somebody whose life resonates with you. And if you do long to be discipled, let us know. Because right now, occasionally from time to time, I'll have a young woman come up to me and ask um, to be discipled or to express interest to be discipled. But I don't know, honestly, who in the church is willing or desirous of that. Um, And so if that is an area that you would be willing to serve, then that's helpful for us to know because then we can help the transition or help somebody find um, someone to disciple. But I do think that when it is self-initiated, it's very helpful. What questions do you have? I feel like this was a drive-by shooting of information, um, and it was a lot. But what is on your mind now? What questions? What are you wondering? Yeah. So you spoke a little bit at the beginning about your dad discipling. Oh, yes. So I'm trying to think as moms, a lot mm-hmm. of us moms here with young children yeah. at home, what does that look like to disciple our kids? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked that. I meant to come back to it. Um, so while I was meeting with Elisa, my dad um, also discipled me at the same time. His was very informal. My dad was a pastor, um, so you know, and he would assign a text to me, and he would have me just read it and study it on my own, and I was supposed to simply come up with what stood out to me and what questions I had. That was it. And so I, you know, I, I love that my dad did this, and so I was very eager. Um, and so I read it, I studied it as best as I could as a kid, and I came up with, you know, I starred stuff, and I wrote questions, and, and when I was ready, I would just, hey, hey, I'm ready to meet about that text. And so sometimes it was a week later, sometimes it was a month later because I was a kid. Um, And there were times that my dad would follow up and say, hey, have you looked at that yet? To try to push me. And when I was ready to discuss it, we would would go to Arby's. (laughs) It was our special place, because he always had coupons. (laughs) And 
and we would just look at the passage together. I would share with him like what stood out to me, what I liked about it. I would ask him questions. And um, I think the thing that I loved about it is that he never was critical or um, I was never shamed by my questions. And he was always able to answer them. Now, there's an advantage that he had that's unfair because he's a pastor. <laughs> you know, like he had, my dad, you could probably say, you know, what's Deuteronomy 7:14, And he could probably tell you. He just has a wealth of just scripture memorized. Um, and so my impression is that he prepared zero for those and was still able to answer all my questions. Now, if I were to do that same thing with my kids, I met with Christopher a little bit last summer. We met on Saturday mornings on the back patio over coffee. He had tea. Um, and, but we, would, we did something similar. I felt like I had to prepare a little bit. Like, I tried to, like, what questions might he have? And so I tried to prep a little bit and, and do that with him. Um, but I think even just memorizing scripture with your kids, I think taking your kids with you when you go to visit somebody who is sick, see them, um, they watch you taking meals to someone. I think all of those things are discipleship with our children. But as they get a little older, push them to get into the word a little bit. Maybe even just give them one verse and say, you know, this week I want you to come up with one thing that you learned from that verse and one question you might have. That's it. Um, but even that time with my dad was super meaningful to me, and I feel like it laid a foundation, on t- you know, along with Elisa's foundation, because it made me value the word, and it made me value discipleship. And it's interesting in that culture... By the time I was in high school, I was discipling a junior higher. As a senior, I was discipling a freshman, and so on. And there were times I was discipling one, and there was times I was discipling four. But it was just the culture of the church, and it was fantastic um, that it was. But that's what it looked like with my dad. Yeah. Any other questions, things you're thinking about? Does this seem like something is doable? Give me a thumbs up if it feels like something that's doable. <laughs> Just like stony silence. <laughs> um, I want to, I'd see if I have it. We have about 10-ish minutes left. Um, I, do you feel like you've gotten some of the practical of what this might look like if you were to come alongside someone? Okay. There is not a right or a wrong way to disciple. Well, there might be. (laughs) They should probably backpedal, backpedal. But there's just a lot of different ways that discipleship can look. So I do, let me point, since we have a few minutes, I want to point you into the resources that you have. And we won't go through all of these, but I do want you to know what's in your hands and how to use them. So the first couple of pages is what discipleship should look like. Um, I think that this first page is just um, about practically speaking, love them, come up with a time to meet. You can read a book together or go through scripture, memorize scripture. I do highly recommend that. Um, Be an encouragement, be in prayer. Um, The second page I do want to point out that you're going to come, if you choose to be discipled or disciple, there's going to be times that you need help. I don't want you to feel like you had this little 90-minute seminar and now you're off. Go ahead. (laughs) Just go ahead and do it. But there's times where you come across something with a disciplee and you don't know the answer. It's beyond your expertise. There is nothing wrong with saying, you know, let's stop and pray about this right now together, but I'm going to need some time to think about this and pray about this and get some more wisdom. Um, And know that you've got pastors and biblical counselors and women in the church who go and ask um, with that disciple's permission, share the situation and get wisdom and come back. There's nothing wrong with that. You should never feel like you have to have all of the answers in order to disciple. The only thing you have to have is a pause button, really. Like, okay, time out. We're going to regroup on this one next week. (laughs) 
or next time we meet. But be sure to regroup on it because it's probably important. Um, and to just be willing to have this person in your home and to speak biblical truth. Um, the next page, which is guidelines for the one-to-one discipler, this is very redundant to the page before, but I included it because it's from a little uh, manual. I kind of summarized it and adapted some of the wording from this ma- a manual on how to individually disciple by Jack Griffin. Um, a couple of things that we haven't talked about that's on this one that I would like to point out is setting goals together. Um, that was one thing. Elisa and I set goals every 30 days, and at the end of 30 days, we reviewed them, and then we also set six-month goals. And those ones um, we would put into an envelope. I don't know what she did with it, but six months later, faithfully, that envelope came out, and we would see where we were at with those goals. And it was amazing the encouragement that was to me as a young believer because I saw Christ working in me. And every single time, a lot of times, to be perfectly honest with you, I would forget about those goals, like the six-month ones. But the Lord had always done it. He'd always done it. I'm sure she prayed it into (laughs) into happening. because. But every single time, um, the Lord was faithful. But I felt like if I hadn't taken the time to... Reevaluate. I probably wouldn't even seen the Lord's hand or acknowledge it if I hadn't stopped and said, okay, what does the last six months look like? Um, and that was a huge blessing with those goals. And that's actually the next sheet. This is um, what she and I used. We just set goals in categories, and then we typically agreed to revisit them every 30 days. And we would share, she did goals, and we would kind of, I felt like we were partners in that. So the next page is a wheel evaluation. um, And this actually comes out of Grace Bible in Bozeman. Um, This is just a way to examine your life. This might honestly be a way to examine your life before you start discipleship. Um, That looking inward part of is there anything that I need to confess or get rid of? And to just jot down in my professional life, body life, finances, et cetera. It's kind of a self-evaluation. Um, the next couple of pages are very similar. Nobody likes spiritual house cleaning. Every group I've given this sheet to has hated it. <laughs> but it's a list of, uh, it's really about interpersonal, cleaning up interpersonal relationships. Um, and normally when I've used this with people, um, we have put real names of real people on each line and then given people a couple of weeks to actually take care of things and come back. And we don't say like, I confronted Betsy this week. It was, I mean, we, right. We use discretion, but I think that it was helpful for me to prayerfully consider my relationships and to take action um, where I needed to. So that one you can, you certainly discuss it with discretion. Um, And the next page I put in here is actually the next few pages. This is a verse analysis page. There were times where um, Elisa assigned a particular text to me, and she and I would both go through. And this essentially walks you through observation, interpretation, and application. So you don't even necessarily have to instruct or have a world of knowledge on that um, hermeneutic, but... It was, and then we would come back and we would discuss it. And it's very, it's a handy sheet. I still use it sometimes in my own personal Bible study. And then the very last thing, oh wait, you have two more things, three more things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Heart for Individuals is just, it's just a great article about discipleship. Um, this is, it's very old, 1983. Um, Lauren Sandy was with the Navigators, which was a big, big discipleship ministry that I was even um, raised with. And the article is largely just about how churches teach, and we get imparted with a lot of information, but we're sometimes bad. And we expect people to grow from just hearing a lot of the word, and we do, but how much more effective it is to have a heart for somebody and to come alongside of them how you can take those sermons they hear on Sundays and really put legs and feet to them 
in someone's life. And then fun accountability questions, and then a resource of books. Ends it, the whole package.